equal rights for Palestinians under international law to every other people. Uh, uh, you look like a bigot. You look like a racist. You cannot be a progressive and a racist. Uh, so we're seeing a, a sea change across the United States, and it's reflecting itself in public opinion polls. Uh, recent polls have shown a huge growth of support for Palestinian rights in the United States, a huge growth for supporting the right to BDS uh, um, in the US. Um, can you hear me? It was frozen for a bit. Can you yeah, hear me? No, just uh, okay. uh, internet. Okay, uh, so, so recent polls have shown that there's a huge growth in support for Palestinian rights and even for the right to BDS. Absolute majorities of the American public support the right to BDS and consider anti-BDS resolutions repressive and uh, conflicting with the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. That, uh, that is an indicator of years of grassroots work by the Solidarity Movement in the United States, by, by partners, uh, all partners, uh, including Jewish uh, progressive partners, Everyone has done such a great job that, 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 that it, there's a huge shift on the ground. It has yet to lead to a shift at the policymaking level, but we're certainly seeing more of a change there as well. Now, I want to go through some of the pieces. First, we discuss about economic boycott. Mm -hmm. So what do we mean by economic boycott? And uh, what are maybe some of the successes and the challenges that have been faced in the area of economic boycotts? And then also what we see often that we are punishing both, we're punishing Israel or the Jewish population often, or also sometimes it says that uh, economic boycotts hurts the Palestinians, which I think in your essay you dealt with that question in a, uh, in a really uh, systematic way. So how to deal with this issue of what is economic boycotts, the successes, the challenges and answering the question, are we punishing the Jewish population or the Palestinian population? Well, to answer that, let me give some very quick context. What is BDS? It is calling for the three basic rights without which Palestinians cannot exercise self-determination. An end to the occupation, end to Israel's system of uh, domination and racial segregation, which meets the UN definition of apartheid, and an end to Israel's denial of Palestinian refugee rights. Those are the three main constituents of the Palestinian people. Palestinians in the occupied territories are 38%. Palestinians who are citizens of present-day Israel are 12%. And Palestinians in exile are 50%. And therefore, BDS addresses the three basic rights. It is inspired by the South African anti-apartheid movement and by the US civil rights movement. So we haven't invented boycotts. We've learned it from our own history of popular resistance. Palestinians have used boycotts all the way back in the 1920s against British colonialism and later Zionist settler colonialism. But we've also learned a lot from the South African experience and the US civil rights movement. One very important issue about BDS is that it is strictly anti-racist. It is based on the UN Declaration of Human Rights, and therefore it rejects all forms of racism, uh, anti-Black racism, anti-Indigenous, anti-Arab, anti-Muslim racism, and certainly anti-Jewish racism. We categorically reject anti-Semitism. Based on that, BDS targets complicity, not identity, which means we target Israeli institutions or international institutions that are complicit in denying our rights. We target companies, whether Israeli or international, if they're involved in violating our basic rights under international law. So identity does not matter as much as complicity is what matters in deciding a BDS campaign. Having said that, no, BDS does not target the Jewish population of Israel. It does not target Israelis as Israelis. It targets the Israeli regime of military occupation, settler colonialism, and apartheid. It targets all institutions and companies that are complicit in maintaining this regime of oppression against the Palestinians, denying us our rights. Uh, so there's absolutely no targeting of any population based on its identity. It's, it's, it's simply false. As, as to the second part of the question, does BDS hurt Palestinians? 
to contextualize this, this, this argument has been raised by the Israel lobby, by the Israeli government and Islamic groups. After soda stream, the Israeli drinks, uh, uh, soda drinks uh, manufacturer, after it lost so much due to BDS campaigns and was forced to shut down its factory in a settlement in the occupied Palestinian territory near Jerusalem. After that, some Palestinian workers, hundreds of Palestinian workers who worked for Soda Stream in that factory became unemployed and Israel used that to say, see, BDS is hurting Palestinians. And it's only Israel and, and its lobby and racist anti-Palestinians who raised this issue that BDS might be hurting Palestinians, as if they care. I mean, Israel has established a whole system of, of ethnically cleansing us, of killing us, as in Gaza, of demolishing our homes. And now suddenly it cares about a few hundred workers losing their jobs. Uh, putting hypocrisy uh, aside, putting the colonial language and the white savior language aside, the, all Palestinian federations of trade unions endorse BDS. There's no exception, all of them. So the BD BDS is supported by the absolute majority of entities representing Palestinian workers. Even opinion polls among workers ask them, uh, would you support a boycott of Israel? The absolute majority do. Why is that? Is this a contra contradiction? I mean, a worker might lose her job or his job in an Israeli factory if BDS hits this factory very hard, as we did with Soda Street. No, there is no contradiction. Palestinians, because of continuous expropriation and theft of their agricultural lands, were forced off the land. Instead of being farmers, sustaining their, their livelihoods, they were forced off the land and had to work in Israeli projects because the Palestinian economy is hostage to Israel's to Israel system of apartheid. There's no other job to work in quite often except working for an Israeli employer. But that doesn't mean that this Palestinian woman or man doesn't want to see the light of freedom, justice, and equality at the end of the very long, dark tunnel of Israeli apartheid. So they have to work in a factory, but that doesn't mean they don't call for a boycott. Very recently, just to finish, there was a strike by Palestinian workers in, a, in an Israeli factory in the occupied territory near Tul Karim. And some of the strikers asked us, for support, and we told them, you want BDS to support? How? You want us to call for a boycott of this factory? Of course, we, we support a boycott of this factory. It's an occupied territory. It's a, it's a very clear cut of case of complicity. And we were very surprised by the leaders of this uh, strike, after consulting with the workers, telling us, you have our blessing. Do call for a boycott of this factory. And we did. So everything we do is in coordination with trade unions, farmers unions, and so on, because BDS is not led by some ivory tower group of academics or intellectuals. It is led by the Palestinian BDS National Committee, the absolute largest coalition in Palestinian society in Palestine and exile. Now, uh, now this conversation about uh, hurting the Palestinians is a similar argument that was made during the South Africa anti-apartheid movement. I remember during our work here in the U.S. with the anti-apartheid movement, we used to check with the ANC. And exactly. in this sense, I think, uh, just asking the question, uh, is there a formal process or at least some way of a consultative process with the BDS movement? Uh, since, again, this is the reflective of what the Palestinian position on BDS and in relations to hurting the Palestinian economy uh, overall? Uh, certainly. The BNC, the Palestinian BDS National Committee, is the leader of the global BDS movement. And as I said, it's the largest Palestinian coalition. So it is the address to, to whom questions should be sent regarding if we boycott, if we divest, if we call for sanctions, are we hurting you? the absolute majority of Palestinians said, go ahead and boycott, divest, and push for sanctions. You're, you're only helping to end your state and your institution's complicity. And that's a profound moral obligation to do no harm. So it's not something that's altruistic. It's not something that's heroic. If you're at UC Berkeley and you call for divestment of, of the University of California at Berkeley, 
divesting its, its investments from all companies involved in human rights violations from Palestine to Baltimore and f from Africa to Europe and everywhere else, you're not doing something heroic. You're fulfilling a moral obligation that your institution that is using your uh, fees, your uh, tuition fees, uh, cannot use this money to invest in human rights violators especially in apartheid Israel. Now, another question that arises uh, in relations to both what I consider to be some of the liberals, but also pro-Zionists, that speaks, well, the Palestinian Authority has economic relations with Israel, there's joint projects, uh, there's uh, technology investments, and now increasingly we have the phenomena of uh, Arab uh, countries that are normalizing relations and opening economic relations. Uh, so how do we at least respond to the question of this rush to normalization, uh, including investment in some of uh, the soccer teams in, in Israel or uh, the recent Abraham Accords that are focused on economic normalization. So what are uh, the responses from the PDS movement to this phenomena that is unfolding in front of our eyes? Uh, BDS works not just inter internationally, it also works internally in, in the occupied Palestinian territories, among Palestinian communities in present-day Israel, and among Palestinians in exile. In the occupied territory of 67, uh, the BDS has repeatedly and very consistently condemned and worked and pressured to end uh, Palestinian official normalization with Israel. We distinguish between negotiation, whether we like negotiation or not is, is a different story, it's beyond our mandate. But what we call normalization are those economic relations that you mentioned, so-called security coordination and so on. We have absolutely condemned those relations of normalization and we have said that 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 Palestinian official normalization is what's opening up the door to despotic Arab regimes to establish normalization relations uh, with Israel. One important thing to remember is that the Palestinian Authority, the current Palestinian official them, is unelected. It doesn't have a democratic mandate. So we criticize it and we call for a democratic mandate. It has to be accountable to the Palestinian people, not according to the whims of this or that uh, leader. On the Arab front, Israel has established uh, growing relations with the most authoritarian police states in the area and possibly in the world. I mean, the United Arab Emirates regime is one of the most uh, savage police regimes around. Uh, uh, um, uh, surveillance, uh, uh, policing speech, arresting activists. Uh, denying people's rights, migrant workers being treated like uh, modern-day slaves, uh, uh, the war crimes committed by the Saudi regime and the United Arab Emirates in Yemen, uh, leading to the death of uh, tens of thousands of Yemenis. Uh, all these war crimes and crimes against humanity compared, uh, com committed by those uh, regimes, uh, they try to whitewash them through their relations with Israel. They understand that if you establish excellent relations with Israel's far-right regime, it might help you with Washington as the Israel lobby, both sides, the traditional Jewish Zionist lobby and the Christian Zionist lobby, which people usually don't talk about, but it's a huge and very influential, extremely fanatic lobby. Uh, so, so you improve your relations in, in Washington if you get closer. To, to, to Israel because of these uh, uh, lobbies. And also you establish military relations that help you as, a, as an authoritarian regime to continue your suppression of human rights in your country and get away with it. And that's exactly what the, Europe, the United Arab Emirates is doing, what Bahrain is doing, what Morocco is doing, and what Sudan is doing, basically. I mean, not exactly the beacons of democracy and human rights uh, are the ones establishing relations uh, with Israel. But what matters is that they, they, the regimes, being despotic, being unelected, undemocratic, do not reflect the opinions of their peoples. 
even uh, lo- uh, think tanks in Washington that are close to the Israel lobby in their surveys of public opinion in the region last year have shown that the absolute majority of the peoples of the region oppose normalization with Israel. The absolute majority still consider uh, still considers Palestine to be the central question for peoples across the Arab region from Morocco to Bahrain. That's, that's the reality, and nothing those regimes are doing can change this reality. Another dimension of the uh, normalization pattern is this whole area of interfaith dialogue, which for us here in the United States, as well as in other places, especially for the Muslim uh, organizations and groups, there's been this whole notion of interfaith dialogue, which at the core of it is basically keeping Palestine out, and we just all can hold hand and Uh, deal with what you call textual differences without discussing the critical issues. And in particular for the Muslim community, there is what's called the Muslim Leadership Initiative, which was uh, a project that uh, sponsored by the Shalom Hartman Institute that uh, took uh, young and upcoming Muslim leaders in the U.S. to take them into a relationship with the Shalom Hartman and so on to understand the relationship of Jewish Americans to Israel as the focal point for interfaith dialogue. So what is the PDS uh, view of one is this whole interfaith dialogue as an avenue to faith washing, which is something that our dear friend Sana Saeed have actually framed in a number of articles discuss this faith washing under the rubric of interfaith dialogue. The BNC has issued a statement very strongly condemning this faith washing. So it's on our website. And that's how we named it as well. Interfaith dialogue is, is perfectly fine, so long as it's based on the common grounds for, 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 for groups, human rights, international law, and then you can discuss whatever else you want. But any interfaith dialogue that is used to whitewash war crimes, crimes against humanity, and an apartheid regime is an interfail, not interfaith. This is a huge failure to uphold basic human rights. Uh, um, Now, the other problem is, I I cannot imagine why any uh, faith community would want to reduce the Jewish community into just the Zionist groups that are anti-Palestinian, that are racist, and that work to whitewash Israel's apartheid day in and day out. How about the progressive Jewish community that stands with us against Israel's apartheid? Even Israel lobby groups like J Street and others in recent surveys in the end of 2020 showed that a very large minority of liberal Jewish Americans supports a full boycott of Israel. So what about this community? Why isn't anyone talking to that community? Why, why aren't you having interfaith with Jewish Voice for Peace? They have a rabbinical council and you can have excellent interfaith dialogue with them based on principles, not on opportunism and, and, and inter, interfail. <laughs> now moving to the issue of uh, academic and cultural boycott. Uh, which was launched in 2004, just a year before the 2005 uh, announcement. We get this notion that uh, by engaging in academic and cultural boycott, you're against uh, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, and again, you are targeting individuals that, uh, in essence, uh, both culture and academic exchange is how people can overcome their differences and so on. Uh, And in uh, on college campuses, again, among uh, administrators and those in leadership position, this theme of countering that this is against academic freedom, this is against uh, freedom of expression, and this is cannot be supported and we are for the free exchange of ideas and so on. So how is the PDS movement respond uh, to this, which often we encounter at the university level? Well, American universities are not what they used to be. They're becoming like corporations. 
with the presidents of the universities becoming CEOs of those companies, and all they care about is their investments. Uh, given this picture, they become much more vulnerable to lobbying by uh, other, other corporate interests, basically. Because of this, many heads of universities are repeating talking points that they're getting from the Israel lobby without even thinking critically about it. So what exactly are we calling for in the academic and cultural boycott of Israel, which was launched before the BDS uh, uh, complete call in 2005? The academic and cultural boycott was launched in 2004. What we called for specifically is a boycott of Israeli academic and cultural institutions due to their complicity in Israel's violations of Palestinian rights. It's, it's apartheid regime, it's occupation, it's settler colonial system. So we did not target identity. Again, we target, targeted complicity. We did not target individuals. We targeted institutions. And this is consistent throughout. We have never targeted individuals. We're targeting institutions. What does that mean in reality? It means that if UC Berkeley were to invite an Israeli anthropologist to give a seminar, a course, whatever, with no institutional relationship with a complicit Israeli university, and all of them are complicit, we're, we're working on a huge uh, research that's coming out uh, in a few months that will be devastating for those universities, exposing their deep complicity in, in, in uh, designing, implementing, and uh, whitewashing and justifying uh, so many aspects of Israel's regime of oppression and, and criminality against Palestinians. So what we're, what we're calling for is that if this anthropologist comes to UC Berkeley without an institutional link with any Israeli complicit institution, nothing in BDS would prevent that. Nothing would prevent her from giving the seminar at UC Berkeley. So we don't call for a bucket of individuals. What we call for is ending UC Berkeley's institutional links with Israeli universities that are deeply involved in war crimes, in war crimes. Hebrew University, Tel Aviv University, Bengal University, Bar Ilan University, Technion, definitely. All of them are deeply involved in war crimes, not just in some minor violations of human rights, in war crimes, in settlements which are considered war crimes, in the wall, in crimes committed against Palestinians in Gaza, in the developing weaponry, developing military doctrines, even the archaeology that is erasing Arab, Palestinian, and Muslim, and Christian history, and trying to, quote, Judaize the entire area to exclude us, to expunge us from history. Those archaeologists work in those universities that condone their work. All the racist theories that Israel is adopting are coming out from academia, and they're not just tolerated, they're celebrated. So we have a lot of reason why we're calling for or a boycott of all Israeli academic institutions because they're deeply complicit. Similarly for cultural institutions, it might seem a little less obvious, but it's not. Uh, Israel's foreign ministry, when they fund an Israeli filmmaker to screen his or her film in California, let's say, they have to sign a contract to get this money from the foreign ministry to go to California and screen their film at the festival. They have to sign a contract as a service provider in which they basically forfeit any claim to, to uh, uh, freedom of expression. They commit themselves to presenting Israel in the best positive light, to defend Israel's policy, and not to negate this policy. Immediately upon finding out about this contract, which was revealed in Haaretz, I believe in 2008, uh, by a very prominent Israeli uh, progressive writer, when we found out about this, the Palestinian campaign for the academic and cultural work of Israel said any Israeli artist, a, a cultural worker, writer, filmmaker who signs for academic, who signs this, is exactly forfeiting any claim to artistic freedom, academic, academic freedom, and are accepting to become ambassadors of apartheid, ambassadors of apartheid Israel. South Africa had very similar academic and cultural uh, uh, apartheid ambassadors who would go around the world and paint such a rosy picture of the bright white society in South Africa, completely covering up the oppression of millions of the indigenous uh, uh, black people in South Africa. So it's the same reality here. And that's why we're calling for a boycott. There's nothing there that violates academic freedom or artistic freedom. Yeah. Um, recalling again the 
uh, anti-apartheid movement, the, both the Reagan administration and the South African government was engaged in the policy which is constructive engagement, which in essence brought in both academics and they were inviting students, student groups to come and visit South Africa and engage in this, in this exchange. But I wanted to actually, in your uh, essay, you mentioned about 1948 and the whole host uh, uh, theft and pillaging of Palestinian textbooks and books and small libraries and so on, which I know that in some of the Israeli universities, there's a whole collections of books that have been taken from Palestinian uh, libraries. And then even 67, as well as during the Intifada, I know that the whole collection of the historian Muhammad Nimr in uh, Nablus, all of his collections was taken uh, by the Israelis and is now held by uh, various archives. So uh, speak a little bit about this structural theft, which is also a form of what you call epistemological uh, directed genocide at the Palestinians because you're taking away their uh, epistemological sources. Uh, textbooks and materials that uh, are right now uh, researched and collected and uh, catalogs what the Israeli archives as well as some of the universities. Uh, absolutely. Uh, when Zionist gangs, ethnically cleansed most Palestinians, even before the establishment of the state and later the Israeli army, part of the ethnic cleansing process, part of the destruction of Palestinian society to build a, a, a Jewish supremacist state in the land of Palestine. Part of that was the destruction of Palestinian uh, uh, knowledge, the destruction of Palestinian education, the, the destruction of Palestinian identity. Um, to, to make a self-fulfilling prophecy of the deeply racist Zionist saying of uh, a, a land without a people for a people without a land, basically erasing the indigenous Palestinians from existence. It's like the white settlers who went the, to what's now the United States, Canada, Latin America, Australia, New Zealand, and elsewhere, and claimed the land was empty. And to, to make that a self-fulfilling prophecy, they committed genocide, killing millions and millions of Native Americans, of indigenous people of this land, of Turtle Island. In the Palestinian case, the murder was not as widespread, obviously, because it was in a completely different era where it wasn't acceptable to kill uh, a million persons. But certainly, the ethnic cleansing reached the majority, more than half of the indigenous Palestinians. As part of this uh, process of this destruction of Palestinian identity, and, and to, to make this a fulfilling prophecy, uh, the destruction of books and the theft of books there were academics accompanying the Israeli occupation army as they went when they were colonizing, neighborhood by neighborhood, going to private home collections, not just community collections, not just institution collections and archives, but home collections. The richer Palestinian families who had a huge archive of books, all of them were stolen, and those that were deemed um, unfit were destroyed. Thousands and thousands of Palestinian books were destroyed around the 1947 to 1949 era. And thousands and thousands were stolen and are still kept, as you mentioned, in Israel's uh, archives, in the National Library, in the Hebrew University, and other universities. Uh, um, but this did not stop there. It, it did not, this, this attempt to erase uh, Palestinian identity, to erase Palestinian education, did not stop there move forward to the first Palestinian Intifada, 1987, when it was launched in 1987. It was a predominantly a nonviolent form of resistance against a foreign occupation, completely justified and, and uh, completely supported by all progressives worldwide. Immediately upon the launch of the Intifada in 1987, almost immediately, within days, Israel shut down Palestinian universities one after the other, some of them, like Birzeit University, was closed for four consecutive years. Imagine some force deciding to close UC Berkeley for four consecutive years, because some students at UC Berkeley were striking for tuition rights, for whatever rights, dorm rights, or any other rights, or against sexual harassment, or for black justice, black liberation, whatever other rights. So some 
forces decided to shut down UC Berkeley because it's a hotbed of radicalism as Palestinian universities were pulled by the Israeli apartheid regime then. But they did not stop with universities. Soon after, Israel, Israel's military authorities shut down all Palestinian schools and then even Palestinian kindergartens. A kid held in the street by the Israeli army, caught in the street by, an, by the Israeli army, carrying a textbook was considered committing a violation of a military order and was the, the book was confiscated accordingly. Palestinian education during that period went underground. Just imagine the concept that Palestinian educators had to invent underground education for grade school from kindergarten to 12th grade and universities. Everything went underground because it was criminalized. Israel effectively criminalized Palestinian education at that time. Some Palestinian academics called this scholasticide. Now, shifting uh, to the next cluster, which is the area of sanctions. I know we have the boycott, the divestment, and then the area of uh, sanctions. Uh, considering the uh, uh, International Court of Justice recent uh, uh, ruling that Palestine is in within their international, international criminal court international criminal court uh, that the territories are within their preview uh, considering that Palestine is uh, a have a state standing uh, where does the prospect for seeking sanctions one is to think sanctions from uh, the Arab and Muslim world I know we have the Arab League and they seem that the only thing they agree on is really to possibly continue to punish the Palestinians. The OIC, Organization of Islamic Cooperation, which often cooperates against Palestinian interests. So how do we go to the next level of seeking sanctions, considering the International Court of Justice uh, ruling and the various uh, ways that Palestine has been placed within the international system? Um, as, as you know well, Hatem, uh, sanctions do not just come out of the blue. They have to be uh, pushed from a grassroots movement. You have to build power from the grassroots up. Uh, you and I were active in the anti-apartheid, South African anti-apartheid movement, and we remember very clearly, we had to build the movement from the grassroots up. I played a very, very tiny role in the anti-apartheid uh, group at Columbia University where I went to school. And it took forever to get Colombia to divest, let alone to push for the United States Congress to impose sanctions on South Africa. At the time, I thought it would be impossible. We would never build enough power across the United States to push for sanctions, but it did happen. And even the Reagan administration and the Thatcher administration in the UK had to drop their objections to sanctions when it became untenable. When the grassroots pressure, when political pressure, media pressure, uh, uh, intelligentsia pressure became too much to, toler to be tolerated, and when businesses started to say enough is enough, when major corporations started to abandon apartheid South Africa, the writing was on the wall. And the, the neoliberal uh, administration in, in the White House and the Thatcher administration had to heed public opinion, had to heed public pressure, and impose sanctions on South Africa. Similarly, even more, this is a more difficult situation with Israel's uh, regime of apartheid. It will take even more effort to build our power base. And we build it in an intersectional way, as, as I spoke before. We don't see Palestinian liberation as separate from all other justice struggles. Uh, climate justice, gender justice, social, economic justice. It is part and parcel of all this wave of, of progressive uh, uh, justice movements against fascism, against xenophobia, against white supremacy, against systemic racism. We have to work together because either we all get liberated or we all stay oppressed. So we, we see this intersectional approach as very important to push for sanctions. But why should an average American person care? Uh, calling for her church or his university, or their trade union, uh, um, to, to, to lobby for sanctions, to pressure elected officials for sanctions. And sanctions can be very targeted. I mean, what we're calling for are targeted and lawful sanctions. We're not calling for 
comprehensive across the board sanctions that hurt everyone and everything. We're calling for very clear, targeted, lawful sanctions, as in cutting military funding to Israel. Why should the United States continue to fund the Israeli militarily to the tune of $3.8 billion annually when infrastructure in the U.S. is looking increasingly like the so-called third world, when hospitals are facing major problems during COVID, when the education system in the U.S. is crumbling? I mean, the U.S. is not what it used to be at, at one point. It always had systemic racism, but at least it had better infrastructure, uh, uh, better job opportunities. What's happening? Why would the United States continue to fund a military occupation, an apartheid regime, to the tunes of billions at the expense of domestic needs for green jobs, for, for health care, for, for uh, social justice, for reparations, for generations and generations of black Americans who've been denied the opportunity to, to, to get out of 400 years of oppression without reparations. How can this happen? So systemic racism will not end simply by uh, 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 changing the makeup of the police force here and there or some training sessions or changing the budget priorities for the police. It will end when this entire system is put into question and when reparations are paid to African Americans, to black Americans, to pay for 400 years of oppression. So with this picture, why should the US taxpayers accept their state con continually funding the Israeli apartheid regime, billions and billions of dollars? So pushing for uh, targeted sanctions, as in cutting military funding to, the, to Israel, is connected to our intersectional struggles for shifting the uh, entire US budget priorities. Instead of 700, 750 billion dollars going to uh, the Pentagon and to the supposed defense, what about investing in infrastructure and jobs and healthcare? So, as part of this shift in priorities, US support for military regimes, for war crimes internationally, for the Saudi regime, for the United Arab Emirates, they don't support them with money, they support them with weapons, with intelligence. All this has to end. The U.S. Uh, uh, government's complicity in, in uh, partnership, I should say, not complicity, it's, it's, it's a complete partner, at least when it comes to Israel, it's a complete uh, uh, defender and funder of Israeli apartheid. It has to stop. Uh, I liked in your essay how um, when you spoke about solidarity that you actually identified four different elements or four different ways that solidarity are expressed. And if you could expand on those four points, at least for us to at least ground ourselves in how solidarity with the Palestinians and the BAS movement fits within this four cluster that you have identified. Uh, just in the interest of time, I'll go quickly over this issue. Uh, many people might think of solidarity as an altruistic uh, um, kind of uh, effort. You know, I, I hear about this uh, drought in some country in the Arab region, in Africa, some floods in South Asia, and I stand in solidarity, donating money or doing something of that sort. That's an altruistic, charitable kind of solidarity. That's, that's a very basic level of solidarity. It reflects human decency, basically. And there are other levels of solidarity. I, I won't go into a lot of details, but the most important form of solidarity is doing no harm, ending complicity. Not the most, uh, uh, not the biggest thing that anyone can do, not the most effective thing one can do, but the most immediate, the most urgent, profound obligation for anyone to do is to make sure that she, he, they are not allowing uh, their money, their investments, their, their uh, names to be used to sustain a system of injustice, a system of oppression. So cutting the links of complicity is the most fundamental level of solidarity. And this is the level that we keep talking about in the BDS movement. So there is the solidarity of internationalism, like uh, Cuba stood with the South African uh, struggle against apartheid by sending weapons and, and training uh, uh, the, the, the resistance forces 
against the regime there. So Cuba played an extremely important role in, in an international, internationalist form of solidarity. But with BDS, we're not even going there. That's a much higher level of solidarity. Uh, uh, we don't expect U.S. troops to go and fight uh, Israel's apartheid regime. Far from it. We're not romantic. We're not, we're not idealistic. But what we expect, what we demand, not just expect, what we demand is cutting the links of complicity, to do no harm, to divest from companies that are enabling Israel's denial of our rights, to end all those links of complicity. If an artist from the U.S. goes to play Tel Aviv, entrenching the apartheid regime, she is violating our rights. She is crossing our picket line. So we're asking her not to do that, not to allow the Israeli regime of oppression to use her name or his name or their name to whitewash, to artwash its regime of apartheid against us. Is that too much to ask? We're asking to do no harm. That's really a profound obligation. Now, now I want to shift uh, to two major pieces. One is the uh, attack of anti-Semitism that is directed at both the PDS movement, but also it's been directed at the Palestinians for the longest period of time. Almost every Palestinian of standing has been accused of uh, anti-Semitism and how anti-Semitism is used as a silencing uh, tactic while Israel have actually strengthened its relations with some of the most anti-Semitic figures globally. So how does the PDF navigate, especially with the recent Jerusalem Declaration on anti-Semitism, as well as the attempt or utilizations of various mechanisms to uh, restrict the PDS with this charge, whether in the United States, Germany, UK, or other places. So how to navigate this a critical question on anti-Semitism. Uh, sure, th thanks for this uh, question. It's the elephant in the room. Whenever you open your mouth about Palestinian rights, it's, it hits you right there. Uh, it's very important to acknowledge that anti-Semitism is real. Anti-Semitism is on the rise. Jewish communities worldwide, especially in the West, especially with the rise of white supremacy, with fascism, with xenophobia, are facing very serious attacks on themselves because they're Jewish. So any attack, any uh, uh, bigotry, any racism, any discrimination against a Jewish person because they're Jewish is anti-Semitism. And that's what the, the recent declaration uh, has adopted as a definition of anti-Semitism, which is the common sense definition. Anti-Semitism is, 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 is a form of racism directed at Jews because they're Jews. That is exactly what anti-Semitism is, and we absolutely uh, accept this definition. What does this have to do with the Palestinian struggle for rights under international law and against a regime of oppression, of colonialism, of apartheid? How is that even connected? And how did that come about? There's a long history of Israel's development of an alternative notion of anti-Semitism, alternative definition that is designed to shield Israel from accountability under international law and to silence not just Palestinians, but silence all uh, defenders of Palestinian rights, all advocates of Palestinian rights, whether Jewish or not. Uh, this took many turns, this definition, until it was passed by the so-called International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance in Europe uh, under enormous US, uh, Israeli uh, and US uh, pressure, actually. And since then, this bogus, fraudulent definition has been imposed, has been pushed in one institution after another, one government after another, one parliament after another. Uh, in, in, in this definition, uh, they give seven examples of, quote, anti-Semitism that have nothing to do with anti-Jewish hatred and everything to do with protecting Israel from accountability. Calling Israel an apartheid state is, according to that bogus definition, a form of anti-Semitism. Well, that makes a number of former Israeli prime ministers, let alone so many Jewish Americans, anti-Semitic, because they all called Israel at one point, those uh, number of prime ministers and many, many, many Jewish Americans have called Israel an apartheid state. In fact, Salem, Israel's most prominent human rights organization, 
recently published a report recognizing what Palestinians have been saying for decades, that aside from being an occupier, a colonial state, Israel is an apartheid state. So now the largest, most respected Israeli human rights organization is anti-Semitic, according to that fraudulent definition. So it's, it's nonsensical. It, it cannot make sense in any institution to adopt it. It's just by lobbying and by intimidation and bullying that it gets passed by Israel's anti-Palestinian, far-right, white supremacist, and fascist friends, most likely, or right-wing parties. Uh, now, what is the problem with that? It is meant to suppress Palestinian rights and BDS. It's meant as a main weapon to suppress uh, BDS because Israel has failed to paint BDS as an anti-Semitic movement. BDS has principles of anti-racism that categorically oppose anti-Jewish racism. Anti-Semitism is explicitly mentioned as a form of racism that we, in the BNC, absolutely reject, absolutely condemn. Not just that, it's not just a theoretical position. When a group in the Arab world, without mentioning names, called itself BDSX, city name in the Arab world, uh, uh, when we discovered that they're uh, publishing cartoons that had anti-Semitic content, we in the BNC wrote to them, you've got to take down those cartoons immediately and post the BDS movement's anti-racist principles or else we'll have to dismiss our movement from you because we don't accept racists. When they failed, after one week ultimatum, when they failed, we uh, published on Facebook that this group is not part of the BDS movement because they publish racist content against Jewish people. So we're very clear about our policy in, in deed and in action, not just, in, in, not just theoretically. Another point that has really rattled Israel, which I mentioned before, the impressive growth of Jewish support for BDS in the United States, especially among Jewish millennia. It is growing tremendously. You go to any major campus in the US, and usually any divestment resolution, any BDS resolution, is passed with a broad support from the Jewish Voice for Peace group or other progressive Jewish groups on that campus, and every an array of every progressive group on campus. Uh, the black groups, the Filipino, the Asian groups, the women's groups, the LGBTQ groups, I mean, massive support for using divestment. But Jewish students have played a very substantial role in mainstreaming BDS in the United States, especially on campuses, and in making calling for a boycott of Israel far less of a taboo. So today you have a, a, a huge minority in the United States supporting sanctions or tougher measures against Israel to stop its occupation and settlements. This is according to recent polls in 2020. So you have almost half the US public support sanctions on Israel. Imagine, where is this reflected in Congress? With the exception of a number of progressive congressmen and, and women, this is not yet reflected. And we have to do a lot more work to transfer, to convert this grassroots power into policy making influence. And that's what several groups are working on, including AMP, including JVP, uh, including the uh, US Campaign for Palestinian Rights, uh, including AFSC, and many other groups are working a lot to, to, to translate this growth of grassroots support for Palestinian rights into policy change. Because ultimately, we've got to cut military funding to Israel's apartheid regime. That's the goal, ultimately. We've, we start by cutting city council's uh, 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 relations with Israel's apartheid regime. Every major city in the US sends its police forces to get trained in Israel, and they have a lot of uh, uh, joint training. We see the result of that on both. The learning the worst example of criminal policing is what's happening in the US and Israeli uh, police. Uh, so we have to push at every single level to push for that uh, uh, policy change. Now, anti-Semitism, where does it fit in this picture? Because of this Jewish support for BDS, and because BDS has been categorically opposed to anti-Semitism, and they've put us under a microscope, I mean, they've searched every word we've said in every language, English, fr French, Arabic, Portuguese, Spanish, German, Italian, and they couldn't find anything, anything 
to incriminate the movement as anti-Semitic. So they had to reinvent. They had to reinvent the definition of anti-Semitism that's not about protecting Jewish communities from bigotry and hatred and violence, which is mostly coming from white supremacists, but to protect Israel. Now, about white supremacists, you're absolutely right, and I wrote this in my article. At the time, Israel is going around as BDS is anti-Semitic, a non-violent movement for Palestinian rights is anti-Semitic. It is in bed with the worst anti-Semites in the world, from Orban in Hungary to Bolsonaro in Brazil to Trump in the former White House to Modi in India to the fascist parties across Europe, alternative for Deutschland, and the worst fascist neo-Nazi parties in Europe are Israel's best friends. How is this accepted by even Zionists who defend Israel and attack Palestinians? When Netanyahu invited in 2018 uh, uh, Orban, the Hungarian prime minister, who's known to be an anti-Semite, and other leaders in Eastern Europe who are known for their anti-immigrant, xenophobic, and anti-Semitic uh, positions, there was some uh, uh, con contest, and some noise in the Knesset, let's say. But one member of the Knesset from Likud, the governing party, her name is uh, Anat Berko, at the time, Said, and this was quoted in Haaretz, they might be anti-Semites, but they're on our side. Just imagine, they might be anti-Semites, but they're on our side, that means on Israel's side. So that captured the essence of Israel's new definition of anti-Semitism. It's okay to be anti-Jewish as long as you're pro-Israel. If you defend Israeli apartheid, we, we give you the certificate you're not an anti-Semite, no matter what you do against uh, uh, Jewish uh, people. So white supremacists in the US get away with, with their anti-Semitism. Evangelical Christian Zionist fanatics get away with their deep, deep, deep anti-Semitism, waiting for the Messiah to convert all Jews or kill them all. I mean, how more anti-Semitic can you get? Mm -hmm. And they're Israel's best friend and, and funders and so on. So that's what's happening with this anti-Semitism fraudulent definition. The, the so-called Jerusalem Declaration that just came out presents a far better alternative. It's still flawed. It's still written without any consultation with Palestinian representative voices, Palestinian civil society, uh, although it does focus on Israel, Palestine, and on Zionism, but it ignores our voices. But regardless, it's a very important tool to fight the so-called IHRA or IRA definition, which is McCarthyite, which is repressive, and which is very, very much anti-Palestinian. Now, a, a continuation on this question uh, that I asked uh, on anti-Semitism, there's often this idea, uh, there's often this idea that the PDS movement really wants the end of Israel and the, uh, the end of the Jews. And what does the PDS movement uh, say about coexistence, uh, uh, having uh, Jewish populations in Palestine. So this often is shaped around a fear that is constructed, a fear of the uh, marginalized, a fear of the Palestinians, which is similar, again, we see it in here in relations of how the blacks are often presented, the fear of the blacks, speaking about black violence, or black on black violence, that if uh, the PDS succeeds, this is the consequences. So how did the BDS really, uh, I know that the BDS movement does not take a position on what is the uh, uh, conclusion of the conflict, but these are statements that are written and in circulation and usually are uh, offered both by political elites as well as defenders of Israel in casting a doubt on the PDS movement. And maybe you could remind us about what are the three principles of the PDS movement. Uh, sure. BDS, again, calls for basic Palestinian rights under international law, ending occupation of the 1967 territory, Gaza and the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, and of course, the occupied Syrian Golan Heights, ending the system of racial discrimination and segregation and domination, which meets the UN definition of apartheid, and the right of return for Palestinian refugees, who happen to be internally displaced persons and refugees, happen to be the largest constituency among Palestinians. Almost 68% of our people are refugees or internally displaced or exilic, living in exile. Uh, 
based on, on, on calling for, for those uh, three rights, we don't adopt a political position uh, because we're not the political leadership of the Palestinian people. We, we're leading the global BDS movement. We're one part, very important part, of Palestinian popular nonviolent resistance and the most important part of international solidarity with the Palestinian struggle for freedom, justice, and equality. As such, we don't adopt a position, but there's a much simpler reason why we don't adopt a position on one state versus two states. The BNC is a huge, huge coalition. And, you know, Palestinians disagree on quite a lot. It's very hard to get this massive coalition to stay in existence since 2007 till now without any splits, without even a fight. We have never had a fight in the DNC, believe it or not. Yes, it's Palestinian, but we've never had a fight because we stick to our mandate. We respect our human rights mandate, international law and the three rights that I mentioned, and the occupation and the apartheid and the right of return for refugees. So we don't take a position. Now, as I said repeatedly, I, in, in my New York Times article 2014, I wrote this. I said, did ending uh, 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 Jim Crow end the United States' existence? Did ending apartheid in South Africa end South African existence? Why would ending injustice in historic Palestine end the existence of Jewish Israelis or Jews I mean, how is that even reasonable to consider? It, it, this only makes sense if and only if Israel's existence is premised on being a military occupation, an apartheid regime, and a settler colony. And if you take those away, then there is no longer Israel. Well, if Israel defines itself that its existence is, 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 uh, is based is founded on those three pillars of injustice, you take away the injustice and there's no longer Israel, that's Israel's problem. That's not our problem. We will fight for our rights to end all injustice. Uh, but that doesn't mean ending the existence of any people. We certainly don't call for expelling anyone or ending anyone's existence. This has never existed in, in our language. Whether in a one-state solution or a two-state solution or a five-state solution, the occupation must end, apartheid must end, and our refugees must enjoy their UN stipulated right to return and to receive reparations. There's no other minimal uh, uh, requirement for justice, for sustainable, peaceful existence based on justice uh, to happen. Now, the last part of your essay, which I thought it was uh, both uh, uh, at least linking to South Africa, Stephen Biko, the uh, consciousness movement, uh, Stephen Biko said that the most dangerous weapons in the hand of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. What you wanted to really speak is about the sense of uh, hopelessness and powerlessness that might be seen relative to the Palestinians. And maybe we could speak about, uh, I think the Palestinians, maybe we find ourselves in the most difficult and the lowest point in our political history. Uh, with all the different dynamics, which some at least saying uh, I'm no longer seeing the possibility of the future. And I thought your response, which I think I want to give you the chance to really delve into how to make uh, this aspect of the PDS, the engagement, the political resistance that is unfolding uh, part and parcel of our reorientations in our political program moving forward. Yes, sure. Um, definitely, Stephen Biko's uh, uh, quote is very important for us. The, the most potent weapon in the hand of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. And Israel has followed this uh, quite literally. Zeev Jabotinsky, one of the major Zionist leaders in the 1920s, uh, published a booklet where he developed the concept of the Iron War. It's called the Iron Wall, actually. What he said is that for colonists, and he did consider uh, uh, Jewish settlers from Europe as colonists, as colonizing Palestine, that's how he called it. When colonists try invade a country and try to take it over from the natives, the natives will resist. That's what, those are terms used by Zayev Jabotinsky. Zionist leaders used to be much more honest then. Um, and he said, there's no way to quell this resistance by the natives except 
uh, uh, behind an iron wall that's independent of the natives and they, that they cannot breach. What he meant by that is an iron wall of despair. We have to instill fear and hopelessness among the oppressed so they will stop resisting. So they will start considering that they have to adapt to this situation of, of colonialism, that they cannot resist us. It's like what happened in, in, in creating the United States, the massive genocide against indigenous uh, uh, people in this land, in, in the United States, uh, creating realities that the, the remaining part of the indigenous uh, population reached the conclusion that there is no way to resist this hegemonic power. So basically, Jabotinsky was saying, you know, minus the genocide, we, we have to do it through massive force, but ultimately to instill fear and hopelessness in their minds. In this sense, BDS is, presents a real challenge to this Israeli strategy, because we do instill hope, not hopelessness, but not romantic, not idealistic hope, based on some revolutionary ultra-left slogans that no one can implement, but based on realistic yet principled slogans that can mobilize pressure, build power to change policy, to affect change that leads to Palestinians uh, 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 getting our basic rights under international law recognized. Uh, so that's the key difference. We're establishing this power to change from the grassroots up, one church at a time, one trade union, one LGBTQ group, one feminist group at a time, uh, cultural networks, artist networks, uh, and so on and so forth, social justice movements, uh, Black Lives Matter groups, and so on. Uh, Lat Latinx uh, groups were building excellent relations with Latino, Latino groups in the United States, Chicano groups, and so on. That's, and of, of course, progressive Jewish groups. That's how we're building power to affect policy change. One city at a time, one state at a time, and ultimately in the U.S. Congress. This Israel recognizes as something very threatening to its system of oppression. And that's why they call BDS a strategic threat of the first order. I mean, it's no coincidence that they view a movement for Palestinian rights, a fighting injustice as a threat, as a strategic threat of the first order, no less. Uh, because they see that it is fighting hopelessness with realistic hope with action, not just reflection, reflection and action with praxis, as Paulo Freire would call it, that can change reality, that can mobilize Palestinian popular resistance and international solidarity, cutting links of complicity. So we work in this uh, BDS movement with a lot of hope, but hope that is really rooted in the heritage of Palestinian struggle and in the struggles of all oppressed groups throughout history fighting oppression and winning against oppression. From Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks to the South African anti-apartheid movement, to the Indian anti-colonial uh, uh, struggle, to the Irish anti-colonial struggle, to the Algerian, to the Egyptian, and every other liberation struggle has influenced us and has helped us to, to, to have roots in this very fertile ground of resistance to oppression. So nothing Israel can do or will do will extinguish this very, very rooted sense of hope and aspiration uh, to, to achieve liberation, to achieve freedom, justice, and equality. Now, maybe the last uh, piece that I thought, again, not to, to say that other pieces, uh, in relations to the PDS strategy, the concept of context-sensitive approach what does that mean and how do we approach it in terms of the context? And I think, again, the PDS is pragmatic in terms of its strategy. So how is this context-sensitive approach and what does it imply and how do we relate to it? Especially as the debate, as you know, on the Palestine have so many participants with all different ideas. So if you could expand a little bit on this context-sensitive approach. Uh, sure. Context sensitivity is one of our key operational principles. The other two are gradualness and uh, sustainability, which means that we can't jump from A to Z. We've got to go gradually, A, B, C, D, until we reach Z. And connected to this, any work we do must be sustainable. Any victories we achieve must be sustainable. We can't just, you know, uh, um, 
uh, use an opportune moment to push for something that's so radical yet very unsustainable. So win a vote in, in a flash and then lose it a couple of months later. That does not help much. That shakes the institution, yes, but and we lose a lot. We lose morale. We lose hope. So we need to sustain victories, to sustain our march forward towards Palestinian rights. And the third principle is context sensitivity that's connected to, to both. What does it mean exactly? It means that in any particular context, human rights defenders, activists working for justice understand best their conditions, their particularities, and what to target, and how to target it, and, and what coalitions to build, and so on. So long as there's no a violation of our principles, then context sensitivity becomes the key issue, the key operational principle. What I mean by that is that BDS always aspires to reach a golden balance between strategic effectiveness and ethical principles. If we take either extreme, we lose. If we become only principled, without any strategic thinking, without any uh, uh, goal-oriented strategies, we can never build power to achieve Palestinian rights. We'll remain in a nice revolutionary bubble where everyone speaks the same language and everyone is very happy about the very radical slogans that no one will implement. That is not revolutionary. That's anything but revolutionary. On the other hand, if someone is totally pragmatic with no sense of principles, if they forget their principles and they just go with the flow, then they can easily be co-opted and they lose sight of why they started the struggle to start with. They, they, they become a, a tool of the oppressor to make things cosmetically look better. So that's not revolutionary either. What's truly revolutionary is to have, adhere to the most important principles, yet devise strategies that are effective and that respond to the context, that are context sensitive. That's how we achieve results. That's how we convince the city council to become an apartheid free zone, as we've done with tens of city councils in the Spanish state and across Europe, with hundreds of cultural centers uh, uh, and community centers and spaces across Europe that have announced themselves apartheid free zones. So we start the change there without uh, betraying our principles. We adhere to our principles, but we have to be strategic and context sensitive. We cannot say something that worked in South Africa must be copy pasted into San Francisco. No, it cannot be. We can get inspired by something done in South Africa, but we've got to adapt it, we've got to change it to, to fit our reality in San Francisco or Ramallah or Haifa or Johannesburg or, or, or Sweden, whatever it is, or India. You have to adapt to the, to the context. So that's why it, it doesn't make sense to have a one-size-fits-all type of strategy in the BDS movement. There is no one-size-fits-all. There's a size that fits a particular context, and that's what context sensitivity in a nutshell is about. Now, to try to come into a conclusion, I know I could, we could sit here and speak for so long. I find the essay is so rich, and I encourage people to access it from the Institute for Palestine Studies. It's a PDF, and I think it's a very important read. Uh, it's important to engage the PDS movement through its own voice, its own narrative, its own writing, its own context, rather than try to respond to whether it's critics or those who are, in essence, attempting once again to marginalize uh, Palestinian voices. As we are in the 15th year of the PDS movement, uh, maybe as we uh, come to uh, wrap up this discussion, where do you see the next stage of the work? Uh, where are areas of hope? Uh, and where are the areas that you encourage us, those who are listening uh, here in the United States and other places? What do you want us to do in this next step in the PDS movement? Um, one thing that we've been working on since last year is calling for targeted and lawful sanctions to stop Israel's apartheid and annexation. De facto, ongoing de facto annexation, escalating de facto annexation, and the threatened de jure, or formal annexation. Since we made that call with Palestinian civil society, uh, uh, 10 former heads of state of Latin American countries and South Africa supported our call 
for the targeted sanctions against Israel, as did hundreds of members of parliament, civil society leaders, political leaders, uh, intellectuals across the global south, Latin America, Asia, and Africa. So we were extremely inspired by this massive outpouring of support for targeted sanctions against Israel. As part of that, we called for a UN investigation of Israeli apartheid. It's high time to pressure every state to vote at the UN General Assembly, at the UN Human Rights Council, or whatever the case may be, to investigate Israeli apartheid. And if it's proven that Israel is indeed uh, uh, imposing a system of apartheid against the entire Palestinian people, as today Betzelen recognizes, as Palestinians have always recognized, then it's time for sanctions. Because apartheid triggers sanctions. Apartheid is the second most severe uh, crime against humanity in international law, and it should trigger sanctions. At the very least, military embargoes, cutting military funding to Israel, ending all military and security trade. This is not just for the Palestinians' sake. Israel's role across the world is horrific supporting death squads in Latin America, authoritarian regimes, dictatorships, genocidal regimes in Africa, Myanmar, and everywhere else. Uh, uh, Israel selling its, its know-how, field-tested weaponry, military technologies, and security, uh, 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 surveillance equipment across the world to target human rights activists, to target uh, journalists, to target LGBT activists, women activists, as happened in Saudi Arabia, in Mexico, uh, Brazil, uh, India, and elsewhere, Israel's impact across the world is horrific. So it is time to impose, to work for imposing sanctions on Israel, as was imposed against the part of South Africa, to end its system of settler colonialism and apartheid. It's really, it's uh, been an enriching and it's a pleasure to have had the discussion with you on this important essay. So I want to make sure that people access the uh, essay from the Institute for Palestine Studies. Uh, we will post this uh, recording on YouTube, so access it and please make sure that you access the material. Uh, but more importantly, I want you to go to the PDS Movement uh, page uh, to volunteer, to seek to be involved, and to always actually seek the advice and the input of those who are really engaged in the Palestine struggle and the PDS movement. I recall and remember during the anti-apartheid movement, we had actually the ANC had an office in New York. So before us taking any step, before engaging in quote interfaith dialogue, before going into a sponsored trip uh, to Palestine for whatever purposes, because again, we have all kinds of these uh, front groups and uh, all types of organizations that are set up to uh, engage the elements of the Arab, Palestinian, Muslim, and allies to make sure that you check with the PDS movement, uh, ask the question where you stand on these issues, and uh, I know that uh, Omar directly and PDS leaders will respond uh, to uh, those questions and those concerns. So I want you to make sure that you access the material from the PDS movement, read the article and the essay, and share it with others. Uh, Omar, it's been a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, it's really uh, an enriching conversation, and definitely I'll have other opportunities for us to engage and continue to plow through uh, making the PDS movement successful and hopefully at one point we could celebrate uh, a free Palestine together, uh, at least uh, maybe in the near future. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum.